Hello everyone, it's me Uncle John. Today I'm going to read S6691 Great Expectation by Charles Dickens. Chapter 8 Visiting Mr. DeWimick and Mr. Jagger, Herbert introduced me to his father, who lived the other side of London in Hammersmith in the next few months. A study hard with Mr. Pocket was always a most kind and helpful teacher. I divided my time between Herbert's and his father's room. Home. If I needed money, I collected it from Wimick and Mr. Jagger's office, and there seemed to be plenty of money available. There were two other gentlemen studying in Mr. Pocket's. They were quite different from each other. Bentley drum. Bantry Drum came from a rich family living in the country. It was lazy, proud, mean, and stupid. I much preferred Startup, who was a uh, pleasant, sensitive young man. He and I used to row our boats up and down the river together, but Herbert was my greatest friend, and we used to spend most of our time with each other. One day when I was collecting my money from the Wimmick, he invited me to his house at the Walworths, the village outside London. You don't mind walking there, Mr. Pitt? Yeah, I like to get some exercise if I can. For dinner, we're having a roast chicken. I think it'll be a good one because I got it from one of our clients. I always accept any little presents from clients, especially if it's cash or anything that can easily be changed into cash. You see these rings I'm wearing, given by client just before they die? All hanged, they were, by the way. I hope you won't mind meeting my aged parent. No, of course not, I said quickly. You haven't had dinner with Mr. Jagger yet. We may continue. Uh, he's inviting you and the other three young gentlemen. Tomorrow, there will be good food and drink at his house. But I'll tell you something, Mr. P. When you're there, look at his housekeeper. Why, I asked. Is there something strange about her? She's like a wild animal, but Mr. Jagger has trained her. Oh yes, he's stronger and cleverer, and more complicated than anyone else in London. And you know, and not another strange thing about him, he never locks his doors or windows at night. Isn't he ever robbed? I asked in surprise. All the thieves in London know where he lives, but none of them would dare to rob him. They are all afraid of him, you see? They know he wouldn't rest until he has seen them hanged. He's a great man, Mr. Pitt. The Wimmick's house at Wellworth was a tiny wooden house in the middle of a garden. On top of the roof was a small gun. We fired the gun at nine o'clock. Every evening, said Wimmick proudly, and behind the house, I call it the, the castle. I keep animals and grow my own vegetables. So in case of enemy attack, we can always eat our own food. What do you think of it? They congratulated him on his home. He was clearly delighted to show visitor all his ideas and improvements. I do everything myself, you know. He said it helps me forget the office for a while. Would you mind being introduced to the aged now? He would like it very much. So we enter the castle where we find the cheerful old man sitting by the fire. Well, aged parent, said Wimmick, how are you? Very well. And replied the old man, nodding happily. Yes, Mr. Pip, aged parent. Nod your head at him, Mr. Pip. He's complete deaf, but he likes to see people nod at him. This is a fine house of my son's, sir, cried the old man, nodding back at me. Should be kept by the nation for the public to visit after my son's death. You're proud of it, aren't you, aged, said Wimmick. His face losing all its usual hardness as he looked at the old man. I hope Mr. Jaggers admires your home. Mr. Wimmick, I asked. He has never been here, never met the aged, never been invited. Now the office is one thing and private life is another. At the office I never speak of the castle, and at the castle I don't think about the office. The aged was obviously looking forward to the evening ceremony of Firing the gun at nine o'clock exactly, Wemmick fired it at the tiny house. As the tiny house shook, the aged jumped up and down in his armchair, 
crying excitedly. I heard it. That's the gun. Supper was excellent and I spent the night in the smallest bedroom I had ever seen next morning. As we make and I walked back to London, I noticed his face becoming drier and harder and his mouth becoming more like a post box again. When we arrived at the office, nobody could have guessed that he had a home or an aged parent or any interest at all outside his work. The Wemick was right in saying that Mr. Jaggers would invite me to dinner, start up, John, but then I was asked to go to the office at 6 o'clock the next morning. Next evening, there we find Jaggers washing his hands and face carefully with perfume soap. This very evening, every evening before going home, he seemed to be washing away his clients and his work like dirt. We all walked to his house together. The housekeeper brought in the first dish. She was about 40, with a strange, wild expression on her pale face. She seemed almost afraid of her master. I looked anxiously at him whenever she entered the room. The food was indeed very good, and the conversation was cheerful, but somehow, Mr. Jaggers made us all show the worst side of our character, and he encouraged that John, who we all dislike, uh, to annoy us. When John, when John speedily said that he was stronger than any of us, we all protested, foolishly showing each other our muscles to prove how strong we were. Suddenly Mr. Jaggers clapped his large hand on the housekeeper's as she was removing a dish. He stopped talking immediately. Gentlemen, look at my housekeeper here. She's stronger than any of you. Molly, show them your wrist. No, please, master, she begged, trying to pull away. But he held her hand firmly. Show them, Molly. She held her, she held her wrist out to us. I have never seen stronger hands than these, he said. There was a silence for a few minutes. All right, Molly, you can go. And she hurried out. During the rest of the dinner, Mr. Jaggers continued to enjoy watching us quarreling with the drum. He gave the impression, surprisingly, of liking the drum very much, but I was glad. When the dinner was over, and Herbert and I could walk quietly back to our rooms together. My dear peer, Mr. Garge, Chapter 9, A Visit from Joe. Mr. Gargery asks me to tell you he will be in London soon and could visit you at 9 o'clock on Tuesday morning at Mr. Herbert Pocket Rooms. If that is all right with you, can I talk about every night and wonder what you're saying and doing? Best wishes, Billy. P.S. I hope you will not refuse to see him, even though you are a gentleman now. He's just such a good man. I received this letter on Monday. Realized that Joe would arrive the next day. I'm sorry to confess that I did not look forward to seeing him at all. If I could have kept him away by paying money, I certainly would have paid money. I knew that his clothes, his manners, and the uneducated way of speaking would make me ashamed of him. Luckily, Herbert would not laugh at him. At nine o'clock the next morning, I heard Joe's clumsy the boots on the stair. At last, he entered the Herbert's rooms. Pip, how are you, Pip? He shook both my hands together. His good, honest face shining with happiness. I'm glad to see you, Joe. Give me your head. But Joe insisted on holding it carefully in front of him. He was wearing his best suit, which didn't fit him at all. Well, what a gentleman you are now, Pip. And you're wonderfully well, Joe. Yes, thank God. And your poor sister is no worse. The beauty is hard, as hard working as ever. But Wopsle is not a charge clock any longer. He's become an actor, acting in one of your London theatre. He is. Joe's eyes rolled around the room, noticing the expensive furniture I had bought recently. Do sit down to breakfast, Mr. Gargery, said Herbert, politely. Joe looked round desperately for a place to put his head, and uh, finally laid it lovingly on a shelf. shelf. Breakfast was a painful experience for me, Joe waved. He's fork in the air so much and dropped so much more than he ate that I was glad. When Herbert left to go to work, I was not, not sensitive enough to realize that it was all my fault and that if I hadn't considered him common, he wouldn't have been so clumsy. Ah, uh, as we are now alone, sir, began Joe. Joe, 
How can you call me sir? He looked at me quietly for the moment. You don't have come, you see. He said slowly and carefully. You wouldn't have had the pleasure of breakfast with you gentlemen, but I had to come. Got a message for you. Pip. Miss Havisham said Estella has come home and would be glad to see you. I felt the blood rush to my face as I heard her name. Now I have given my message, so just standing up and picking up his whip I wish you even more success. But you aren't leaving already, Joe, I protested. Yes, I am. Our eyes met, and all the sir melted out of his honest heart as he gave me, as he gave me his hand. Dear old boy, life is full of so many good boys. I'm a blacksmith. You're a gentleman. We must live apart. I'm not proud. It's just that I want to be in the right place. I'm wrong in this clothes. Now I'm wrong in London, but I'm fine at the forge, or in the kitchen, or on the marshes. You won't find so much wrong with me if you come to see Job, the blacksmith at the old forge, doing the old work. I know I'm stupid, but I think I've understood this at last. And so God bless you, Pip, dear old boy. God bless you. His words are spoken simply and from the heart, touched me deeply. By the time I had managed to control my tear, looked around for him, he's, he had gone, he had gone. Decided to visit Miss Havisham as soon as possible. Next day when I arrived to take my seat on the coach to our town, I discovered I was just sitting in front of two convicts who were being taken to the prison ships by their guard. The prisoners wore handcuffs, iron chains on their legs, with horror, I suddenly recognized one of them. He was the man in our village pub who had given me the two pound note. And strangely enough, during the journey, I heard the prisoners talking about it. So, Magwitch asked you to give the boy two pounds. Trusted you to do it. That's right, and I did what he asked. The boy had helped him, you see, for him, fed him, and kept his secret. What happened to Magwitch in the end? They sent him to Australia for life because he tried to escape from the prison ships. I knew I looked so different that, that he wouldn't recognize me, but I was afraid all the same. All the horror of my childhood experience with the escape convict had come back to me just when I thought it was safe to forget it. But once we had arrived, I was on my way to Miss Havisham's house. I thought only uh, 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 my bright future, she had adopted Estella, she had more or less adopted me. She perhaps wanted me to inherit the dark old house and to marry Estella. But even though I was in love, I didn't hide from myself the fact that I would be unhappy with Estella. I loved her because I couldn't stop myself loving her. I was surprised to see Oleg opening the gate to me. Uh, so you aren't working for Joe any longer? I asked. As you see, young master, he said rudely. I knew he could not be trusted, and I decided to tell Mr. Jaggers that Oli was not responsible enough to work for Miss Havisham. Mr. Jaggers would probably send him away. When I entered Miss Havisham's room, there was a well-dressed lady sitting with her, and she lifted her head and looked at me. I realized it was Estella. She had become so beautiful that I felt very distant from her. In spite of all my education, I still seem to be the coarse, common boy. She used to laugh at, laugh at. She changed very much. Hasn't she, Pip? asked Miss Havisham, laughing wickedly. I replied confusedly. I could see that Estella was still proud and knew that it was also she who made me feel ashamed of home and Joe, but I also knew that I could never stop loving her. She and I walked in the uh, ancient garden, talking quietly about our childhood meeting. Now that we were adults, she seemed to accept me as a friend. I could not have been happier. I felt sure Miss Havisham had chosen us for each other. What a fool I was. Suddenly the, she stopped and turned to me. Miss Havisham may want us to spend more time together in future, but in that case, I must warn you that I have no heart. I can never fall in love. I can't believe that I replied as she looked straight at me. I recognized something in her face that I seen the expression recently. 
on another woman when we went back to the house miss havisham spoke to me alone do you admire her peep she asked eagerly everybody who sees her must admire her she pulled my head down to hers with her bony arm miss will love her love her love her if she likes you love her if she hurts you love her if she tears your heart to pieces love her I could feel the muscles on her thin, thin arm round my neck. She's so, so angry that she could have been talking about hate or revenge or death rather than love. Chapter 10. Pip and Herbert talk about love. I returned to London dreaming of the beautiful girl, now a woman, who had so influenced my childhood and who, I hope, would share my future life. I'm sorry to say I did not think about dear girl with joy at all. I felt... I had to express my feelings to someone, and so that evening, I told Herbert my secret. Instead of being surprised, as I expected, my friend replied, I know that already, Handel. You never told me, but it was obvious you have always loved Estella. It's very lucky that you seem to have been chosen to marry her. Does she admire you? I shook my head, sadly, not at all. And Herbert, you may think me lucky, I have great expectation, I know, but all that... Depends on one person, I still don't really know how much I'll receive or when. Nothing is certain. Now, Handel, don't lose hope. Mr. Jagger himself told you you'd have a large fortune, didn't he? He'd never make a mistake about something like that. Anyway, you will be 21 soon. Perhaps you will discover more then. Thank you, Herbert, I said. Feeling much better, but I want you to... I want to ask you something, my dear Handel. Looking serious for one, think of Estella and her education and how unhappy you may be with her. Couldn't you possibly, and I'm saying this as a friend, remember, couldn't you forget about her? I know you're right, Herbert, I said miserably, but I can never stop loving her. Well, never mind. Now I have something to tell you myself. I'm engaged. May I ask the young lady's name? Clara, her mother's dad. She lives with her father. We must keep our feelings for each other's secret. Because I haven't enough money to marry her yet. As soon as I start insuring ships, you can marry. Herbert tried to look hopeful about his future. But this time, he couldn't even manage his usual cheerful smile. One day, I received a letter which made my heart beat fast. I'm coming to London the day after tomorrow by the midday coach. Miss Havisham wants you to meet me, Estella. If there had been time, I'd have ordered several new suits. I ate nothing until the day arrived. And all morning I waited impatiently for the coach. As I took her to the house in London where Miss Havisham had arranged for her to uh, to stay, her life seemed to be planted, planned by Miss Havisham right down to the smallest detail. I only hoped I was part of that plan. Chapter 11. Pip attends a burial. One evening, <coughs> black-edged envelope was delivered to me at Herbert's room. The letter inside informed me that Mrs. J. Gargery had died the previous Monday and that the burial would be next Monday at 3 p.m. This news came as a shock to me. It was the first time that someone close to me had died and I could not imagine life without my sister even if I had never loved her or even thought about her recently. I arrived at the forge early on Monday afternoon. Joe was sitting in the front room, wrapped in a black cloak. Dear Joe, how are you? I asked. Pip, dear old boy. You know, you knew her when she was a fine woman and he could say no more. Biddy in her neat little black dress was busy serving food. Oh, 
all the friends from the village were talking quietly among themselves. And I noticed the awful Pumbachu trying to catch my eye as he drank brandy and swallowed large pieces of cake. May I, my dear sir, may I? He asked, his mouth full, and shook my hand enthusiastically. My sister's dead body was carried off slowly out of the house and through the village, followed by all of us. We could see the marshes and the sails of ships on the river, and there, in the churchyard, next to my unknown parents, my sister was laid quietly in the earth, while the birds sang and the clouds danced in the sky. Biddy, Joe, and I felt better when all the guests had gone and we had a quiet supper together. I decided to spend the night at the forge which pleased you very much. I was pleased with myself for offering to do so. I waited until I found Biddy's alone. Then I said, I suppose you won't be able to stay here now. Will you, Biddy? <clears throat> no, Mr. P. I'll stay in the village, but I'll still look after Miss, Mr. Gajri as much as I can. How are you going to live, Biddy, if you want any money? I'm going to be the village school teacher, she said quickly. Her cheers, cheeks pink. I can earn my own money. Tell me, Biddy, how did my sister die? She had been worse than usual when one evening she said, uh, uh, Biddy clearly Joe went to the forge to fetch him, put arms around his neck, and laid her head on his shoulder quite happy. Uh, once she said sorry, and once peer, she never lifted her head up again, and an hour later she died. Biddy cried, and I cried too. What happened to Oleg, Biddy? He's just still in the village. He doesn't work for Miss Havisham anymore, you know. He follows me sometimes. You must tell me if he bothers you, Biddy. I'll be here more often now. I'm not going to leave poor Joe alone. Biddy said nothing. Come, Biddy. What do you, what do you mean by this silence? Are you quite sure that uh, you will come to see him? Oh, Biddy, this really is a bad side to your character. Don't say any more. That evening, I thought how unkind, how unjust Biddy was to me. <clears throat> Next morning, I looked at the forge before leaving and said goodbye to Joe, who was already hard at work. I shall be back to see you soon, Joe. Never too soon, sir, and never too often, Pip. As I walked away, I think I knew that I wouldn't go back. Biddy was right. In London, I did some serious thinking. I could see that my character hadn't improved since I had heard about my expectation. I was spending far too much money. What was worse? I was a bad influence on Herbert. Was also spending too much. I would have offered to pay his bill, but he was too proud to listen to such a suggestion. I had hoped that on my 21st birthday, I would discover more about my future, but Mr. Jaggers explained that he could not give me any more information except that from now on, I would have 500 pounds a year to spend as I liked. I thought, I certainly thought of a way I could help Herbert. When I asked Wemek if he could advise me on how to help a friend start up his business, his postbox mouse opened wide. Choose one of the six London Bridge and throw your money over it. That's better than investing money for a friend. That's my official opinion, of course. I asked so you to give me a different opinion at well, worse. You'll be welcome there, Mr. Pip, on private business. I visited Wimek and his aged parents at the castle. This time there was a lady called uh, Miss uh, Skiffins, uh, clearly a regular visitor, uh, who made a tea and sat next to Wimek on the sofa. When he and I were alone, 
women listened carefully to my request and after thinking hard, found an answer. With his help, I arranged to invest some money in a shipping company called uh, the Clarica. Finally, I signed an agreement with them in which they promised to offer Herbert a job, later to make him a partner. At least I felt that my expectation had done some good to someone. Pip discovers the truth. While Estella lived in London, staying with friends of Miss Havisham's, I often visited her. She had uh, an endless stream of admirers, and I was jealous of all of them. I never had an hour's happiness with her, but I still thought about her, day and night, and my dearest wish was to marry her. Several times Miss Havisham ordered me to bring Estella to visit her, and of course I always obeyed. Estella was as proud and cold as ever with her admirers, with Miss Havisham and with me. One man who admired her and followed her everywhere was the unpleasant Bentley Drum. One day I asked her about him, Estella, why do you encourage someone like Drum? You know very well he's stupid and nobody likes him. Don't be foolish, Pip. Perhaps I encourage him because that has a certain effect on the others, but he isn't worth it. I cried angrily, what difference does it make? If I smile at him, it's because it means nothing to me. You should be glad that I don't give you false looks or smile. At least I'm always honest with you. But while my heart was aching for Estella, I had no idea that I would soon be hit by a disaster, which would completely destroy my hopes and dream. <clears throat> the chain of events which had begun before I have a matter was slowly reaching its end. Herbert and I had moved to rooms in a house by the river in the temple area. One evening he was ab abroad on business and I was alone at home reading. It was terrible weather, stormy and wet, with uh, deep mud in the street. The wind rushing up the river shook the whole building and the rain beat violently against the window. As I closed the book at 11 o'clock, I heard a heavy footstep on the stove and I went to the door. I saw a man coming slowly up there. He was wearing rough clothes. He was about 60, with a brown face and long gray hair. But what really surprised me was that he was holding out both hands to me. Can I help you? I asked politely, but coldly. Ah, oh, yes, he said, dropping his hand. Yes, I'd explain. I came into the sitting room where he looked round admiringly at my funny chant books. He held out his hands to me again, but I refused to take them. He sat down heavily in, in a chair, rubbed his eyes with one rather dirty hand. You see, it's, a, it's disappointing. Looked forward to this day for so long I have. But it's not your fault, I'll explain. Is there anybody near who can hear us? Why do you, a stranger visiting me late at night, ask that question? I asked, and then suddenly I knew who he was. In spite of the years that had passed, I was just sure he was my convict. Then when he held out his hands again, this time I took them. He raised my hands to his lips and kissed him. You helped me all those years ago, Pierre. Never forgotten it. He seemed to want to put his arms around me, but I stopped him. You feel great to me for what I did in my childhood. I hope you have improved your way of life now. It wasn't necessary to come here to thank me, but you must understand that, uh, as I noticed how strangely he was staring at me. What must I understand, he asked. His eyes are fixed on me that I don't, Wish to be your friend. You and I met once in the paper. Now our lives are separate. Will you have a drink before you leave? As I handed him a glass of rum, I noticed that his eyes were full of tears. I'm sorry if that sounds hard. I didn't mean it to be. Good luck in the future. We drank together. How have you been living recently? I was sent to Austria, you know, because I escaped from the prison ship. After several years, I finished my punishment. And so I was allowed to work for myself. I did every kind of job there. It was a hard life, but I made a lot of money. I'm glad to hear it, I said. That reminds me. I must give you back the two pounds you sent me. I don't need it now. And I handed him two new pound notes from my purse, still watching me. He held them near the lamp until they caught fire. Oh, may I ask? He said, how, how you have done so well since you and I met on those lonely marshes. 
His eyes were still fixed on mine. I began to tremble. I've been chosen to inherit a fortune. Uh, perhaps I can guess how much. Could it be, well, 500 pounds a year? I stood up, holding on to the back of my chair, my heart beating like a hammer. The agent who arranged it all, he continued, was he perhaps a lawyer named of, uh, Jaggers? Suddenly, I realized the awful truth. I could not speak, nor breathe, and fell down to the sofa. He brought his fierce old face close to mine and bent over me. Yes, P, my dear boy, I made a gentleman of you. You see, I promised myself that all the money I earned out there in Australia should go to you. I'm your second father, Pip. I'm not a gentleman myself. I didn't go to school, but I've got you, Pip. And look at the gentleman you are. What a gentleman you are. And what books you've got. You'll read them to me, Pip. I'll be proud of you even if I can't understand them. Didn't you ever think it could be me who was sending the money? Oh, no, 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 no. Never, never. Wasn't anyone else involved at all? No, just me. And Jaggers, of course. Who else could there be, dear boy? I kept myself going, you see, through all the hard work just by thinking of you. And I promised myself I would come back to England one day and see my boy. He laid his hand on my shoulder. Now you must find the bed for me, he added. Remember, not a word to anybody. I was just sent away for life. And they will hang me if they discover I have come back. My feelings were horribly confused. The man who had paid for my education and luxuries for years was risking his life to see me. I could not like him. In fact, my whole body trembled with disgust when he touched me, but I had to protect him. He went to sleep in Herbert's room after locking all the doors carefully. I sat weakly down by the fire and tried to make sense of my life. How foolish my dreams had been. Miss Havisham had never intended to make me rich or let me marry Estella, but there was something worse than that. It was for this convict who could be caught and hanged at any moment that I had deserted Joe. I could never, never, never forgive myself for that. At the end.